Good evening. I'm Bob Duffy, Planning Director for Arlington County Planning. And on behalf of our county board, our county manager, Barbara Dinellen, and our director, Robert Brosnan, uh, thank you for this second program in the Roundabout Speaker Series, which uh, we've launched recently. Uh, as all of you know, Arlington has really been a regional and national leader uh, in terms of its focus on advancing innovative planning, transit-oriented development, smart and sustainable growth. And particularly the connection between transportation, urban design, and placemaking has been really a central part of Arlington's uh, community planning and development program. And this series really will help to explore and give some perspective, I think, uh, from a number of national and leading experts. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have one of those uh, professionals with us this evening. But our goals really for this program are, are, are a number. And really to continue to advance Arlington's commitment to smart and sustainable planning and growth management, provide awareness and emphasis on the importance of urban design and placemaking, uh, to explore the fullest possible range of urban design, planning, transportation, and their intersection with community and transitory development strategies. So we have a number of goals that we are attempting to achieve uh, through this program. And again, we're delighted that you're all here with us this evening. Uh, so with that background, uh, this evening we're very fortunate to have Victor Dover with us. Uh, Victor Dover, a principal with Dover Coal. Uh, he's no stranger to Arlington. He's done extensive work both in Arlington and surrounding uh, community. Uh, you remember that the work that Victor Dover and his firm did on Columbia Pike in particular uh, has been nationally recognized and we're very pleased to have Victor here tonight. His focus is gonna be new thoughts on streets and cities. And as you'll hear, Victor has a new publication that's about to be released that I think will be uh, a, uh, a significant work on, on uh, placemaking and uh, uh, streets and cities across the country. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Justin Falango, Arlington County's uh, Chief Architect and Urban Designer, who uh, before joining us uh, about six months ago, was a colleague of Victor's with Dover Cole. And I have to say, if you haven't met uh, Justin, he's been an outstanding addition. He brings talent and experience that uh, will benefit Arlington County for many years to come. So Justin. Thank you, Bob. Um, so, you know, it, an urban designer just by nature has to be exceptionally well-rounded. Um, you know, you have to know a little bit about everything or at least pretend to know a little bit about out of everything. Um, you know, you have to know uh, about streets, you have to know about planning and zoning and architecture and traffic patterns and parking, uh, real estate, just a, just a whole, whole lot of things. Um, and in that respect, uh, I think Victor is a truly exceptional um, urban designer. I mean, Victor knows a lot about a lot of things, um, not just a little. Um, and so, um, uh, I, I've had the, you know, the, the, uh, the great opportunity to work with Victor for the past eight years in just about every state and several continents. Um, so I'm glad he could make it here today. Um, and uh, hopefully you can pick up a copy of his book as well um, about street design. Um, and I think that'll kind of show um, just sort of the, the, the depth of knowledge that he has about sort of a great deal of things. So um, Victor, thank you, for, thank you for coming today, by the way. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. I, in urban design, what really happens is that we're in the before and after business. And I love coming back to Arlington County because we can see the unfolding of the before and after sequence on places like Columbia Pike, where we got to work years ago and, uh, and see the progress that you're making. And I know when you live here, it's probably difficult. You know, you know, years go by and things happen very slowly and you kind of put it out of mind. When you go away for a while and you come back, you actually get astonished. It's as if the glacier actually moved and we could see it move because we can see the difference between before and after. And I'm really encouraged to see the changes that were, have been happening for two generations in Arlington County continue to have. Um, the before and after business means starting with places that have the makings of dramatic before and afters and uh, imagining how they might be if you change them into something else. That's what we do. 
And the fun part of the job is making pictures of the way things look now turn into pictures of the way they could be or should be uh, under one or another scenarios. So we always show before and afters is like these which were created by Steve Price for Fairfax mm -hmm. uh, to get people thinking about the place they thought they knew differently. Um, it's like getting a conversation going. Um, the other thing about before and after pictures is that when we leave the, the after picture on the screen for a little while, and then we turn it back to before, you ask yourself, well, why did anybody deliberately design it that way in the first place, or build it that way, or regulate it that way, and that kind of thing. And that's very, um, that's very deliberate. It's, um, it's part of our job as subversive propagandists to create that sense of urgency or questioning uh, about the way things are. Um, I had to start with a Go Hokies picture, yeah. by the way. <laughs> that's, uh, that's for you, Deb. Uh, so in Arlington County, we got to do this before and after thing. Uh, in 2002, and again, 10 years later, with the, um, the expansion of the effort begun uh, in the Columbia Pike Revitalization <coughs> Plan to extend out from the nodes into the areas between uh, the station areas and the future streetcar. And it was fun to go watch you all go through a community process in which you uh, went from assuming uh, Columbia Pike, which had so little investment for really a generation and a half, uh, could get restored as an address. And you could go from thinking something like premium transit on that corridor was a figment of your imaginations to imagining it being done soon. That's, a, that's the process that conversation leads to. Uh, so we're proud to be part of that. Now, John Massengale and I, uh, independently came to the same conclusion. And I think Justin's probably come to it, and a lot of those of you in the room who work in urban design have come to it too. The hardest thing to do is to get the streets right. Um, it should be easiest, actually, because there's such uh, command and control of the public realm in the public rights way, and yet it's actually quite difficult to transform corridors in particular. The folks from Lee Highway who are getting started over there uh, on a rethinking of Lee Highway should talk to our friends on Columbia Pike and, uh, and in Clarendon and he realize they're, they're about to climb an exciting but steep mountain because it takes a long time uh, and it's difficult. And we thought, why is that? And so the book was provoked partly by that. And we went on an amazing journey. Uh, we went back to places we thought we knew well. Uh, Wiley asked us to write a book, and we picked street design because we assumed we knew that story inside out and could just sit down and knock it out. Three and a half years later, really, three and a half years later, <laughs> when they finally start shipping in about two weeks, it took a long time to do it. And partly because we challenged our assumptions, we went back to places we thought we knew well and found out we didn't know them as well as we thought. We found some that used to be great that had changed into places that weren't as good and asked ourselves why that was. We took um, somewhere between 15,000 and 18,000 new pictures and did a lot of new measurements and drawings and things. Um, and that made us come to some new conclusions. And I'll get to show you some of those tonight. This is only the second time I've been able to show an audience the insides of the book. So bear with me because it's kind of fun after a long time of sitting on it to be able to show you some of the pictures that are inside it. And hopefully that will lead to provocative questions for me and Dennis uh, afterward. The, the the first thing you realize is that street designs have always been a marker of advanced civilizations. It's not new. That's, that's what we should expect from them. Um, like That's the Appian way. So for a long time, the advanced societies declared themselves such by building streets. And societies that were changing, they were on a path to progress, that were trying to make something new, started with streets. If you're Captain John Smith and you arrive at Old Point Comfort and you're getting started, you build a stockade first, and what's the very next thing you do? You build a street. You, well, you clear a path into the land so that you can go from here to there and settle along it. And in the process, instead of just making a route from A to B, you have also created addresses all along it. And from there, we go on to build cities. Now, that civilization has done, <laughs> those advanced civilizations have done really well, and they've done not so well, particularly when we built really quickly. Uh, so the book was also provoked by a sense of colossal societal failure uh, to deliver on that promise that streets should be markers of advanced civilization. Uh, you 
find is the more you dig into it, uh, a sense of decline in that tradition. We always ask audiences with the keypad, polling devices, things like, did your parents walk to school? Okay, did you walk to school? Okay, did the kids in your family walk to school? And we see this kind of pattern. And while that's just one little canary in the coal mine indicating a much bigger set of problems, uh, streets have a lot to do with it. We were also provoked by a sense that there's a little bit of a revolution underway. If you haven't already heard it, by the way, the, the percentage of those aged 16 to 19 that have driver's licenses in this country has fallen precipitously, especially in the last five years. It has fallen off a demographic cliff. And you ask yourself why, and you might come up with answers like, well, there was a recession, so if there's an adult competing with you for that burger flipping job, you don't need a job to go get to, you don't need the car to go to work to flip the burgers. It's one possible explanation. And you might tell yourself, part of that is because if you're on Facebook or you're tweeting or <coughs> Snapchat or something, you may not need that face-to-face -face contact or as much travel, so why bother with a driver's license? But I bet the more you dig, you will eventually find that there's a huge cultural shift taking place across generations. What, now, this is a test question. How many of you in the room, seeing as most of you are over age 16, <laughs> how many of you in the room, when you turned 16 on your 16th birthday or very soon thereafter, did what I did and marched to the DMV and got your driver's license? For us, it was like the rite of passage. It represented freedom the liberty of being able to go whenever you wanted, wherever you wanted, uh, and we all did it. And for this group, including my kids that are 18 and 20, now the car just represents cost. It's like a burden. It's expensive gas and expensive tires and expensive vehicle and expensive insurance, but it's also being stuck in traffic. Not freedom, but being stuck. It's a tedium, circling around looking for a parking space all over town and spending a lot of your life in your car. And so there is a generation gap, there is a generational revolt, and that revolt is partly around this business of what's cool and what's not. We thought it was cool to get out on the open road and enjoy the last years, at least in my case, of the golden age of the automobile. I think, Justin, by the time you got your driver's license, it was already over. The traffic was already too bad. But we were still free flowing. Now what's cool? What's cool is not the, the Brady Bunch Partridge family auto-oriented lifestyle or the Ozzy and Harriet Leave it to Beaver lifestyle that preceded it. It's the Friends, Seinfeld, Sex in the City lifestyle that's more likely to be spent walking on the street or riding a fixed gear bike in the hip part of town. Now, as we went on the journey, we also we were reminded how good our human species was once at making great streets. It used to be really natural at it. it used to come we, we were able to do it very naturally. We did it all the time in every part of the globe, in every climate, in every culture. We made that locally distinct version of wonderful street space. And I think we are actually in a time now where we're recovering that innate instinct for streets. Uh, and that's part of what provoked the book. And they're not all alike. They are, in fact, locally distinct. There are street design ideas that seem better for Stockholm and street design ideas that seem better for Myers Park, one of John Nolan's designs. There are all kinds of contexts. We were good at making streets in the sleepy village and in the heart of the metropolis. In different ways we would do it, but we always made streets. Now, when you're there, the streets that seem to draw us back have a kind of wholeness. It's an ensemble of things that are all happening simultaneously in the design and, and placemaking that make it a place where people want to be. And that's the fundamental goal. For a long time, the assumption was this public facility of the street has only one purpose, which is to facilitate and speed the free flow of automobiles and or garbage trucks and fire trucks and moving vans and what have you. But that has actually changed a lot. And we'll talk about that some as we go through tonight. Um, in the end, that is important, but it's not the only thing that's important. And I think most of you know that. The streets we used to build to satisfy that desire for places where people want to be aren't all the same. 
some of them are leafy, and and uh, have the buildings set fairly far apart, and that kind of thing. They use um, trees and fences and these things to define the character of the space. And others are like the street you saw in Paris. They all have some kind of a very familiar and comfortable spatial enclosure. That um, there is a tendency to think of street design as meaning where do we put the curb, and how big are the lanes. And maybe where do we put the stormwater facilities like the storm drain inlets or, um, or the lamp posts and things like that. And when I talk about street design, I am talking about that, but also the rest of the puzzle, the private parts of the puzzle uh, that shape the street space as a public room, like the private buildings on the sides or the street trees or both. And there's a kind of artfulness that occasionally happens. And when that happens, we make places that people stick up for and they recycle. So what's interesting is we get these benefits that go beyond the ability to go from A to B. We get a street that's not just a way to get from here to there, but a place worth getting. And when we get that, we get fewer vehicle miles traveled, and we get better property values and a stronger tax base, and we get less carbon footprint, and we get more sales per square foot, and so on. But the one of the most important things we get is that address that can be reused. You know, somebody wants to be there, so if the building needs to be replaced, it's replaced with another one that takes advantage of that address. Or the use is no longer appropriate, we reuse the building or the address for something new, and it becomes a living and changing part of a lasting city. All those places where people want to be are a little oversubscribed, and so like Nantucket here gets so crowded <coughs> because so many people want to be on that street. And of course, <coughs> When that happens, when scarcity is applied to the law of supply and demand, prices also rise. And they can rise to the point of beyond sustainability, as we grappled with uh, in the second decade of the Columbia Pike revitalization, where now part of the problem isn't just about how do we get the lights turned back on upstairs, but how do we keep the place affordable even as the population grows? How do we deal with the changes that cause uh, the rents to rise faster than incomes? Uh, and so it's great to be in Arlington where that's been worked on a lot. Well, we either make a place where people want to be or not. And it's a cliche to show the snout houses. I, I know every new urbanist has to have at least one snout house picture in their slideshow, and I am guilty of that. But just think about it like this. Places where people want to be or not. It turns out that those little decisions that we make on one little lot have reverberation effects. They, they reverberate for centuries across geography as well as time. Uh, some places manage to get it well enough right, even if it's imperfect, that they get better and better with change over time. Savannah is one of those places that got denser and got better. And that is a crucial need, because as our most popular cities grow, like yours is growing, uh, we have to get good at adding things to it, at adding people to it, at adding businesses and institutions and change. We have to rekindle our faith and confidence in the idea that change will make things better rather than worse, that growth could make things better rather than worse. And we're all a little skeptical about that, right? Saying of our conditioning as 21st century Americans. A lot of stuff was built all around us. We can't refute that evidence that change and growth might make things worse rather than better. And so. How do we get that confidence back that we can build our way out of our problems? Well, the only solution is to build in a more compact and dense and complete way. But as we do, we want people to come outside and be in the public realm and make it work. Uh, we want them to find alternatives to driving everywhere so that the people who do need to use the road can find their way. Um, but everybody else that might be able to take a short trip instead of a long one or even use their bike or walk or use transit, we'll have that alternative. We want that to happen. We have to make a place where they want to be. Because they won't accept just, it's good for you, eat your beans, build more densely. Well, we can't do anything about it. It has to be more dense. It's the economic imperative. And besides, it's good for the planet. Nobody's going to buy that. We'll only buy smart growth's fundamental uh, premise, which is building good, compact places, if they are, in fact, good compact places. Now, this is Bologna. 
And the person who lives upstairs in that corner um, up there can walk down the street and find fresh vegetables on this corner. In fact, the people who live on that street have been able to do that on this corner for the last 500 years. So there's a kind of certainty and positivity of that uh, that only comes about from building a place where people live both closer together for their own convenience, but also for their own fun and for, des and for desire. So when we build new streets, we're trying to find ways to rekindle that confidence, that we can build things closer together and it will still be beautiful. Uh, this is Swift Street, like the name, Dennis. It's the skinniest street built in Colorado uh, in a couple of generations. Uh, it's not named after the design speed. It's named after Peter Swift, the traffic engineer, who, designed, who, who uh, <laughs> stuck up for the skinny street details of it. It's the slowest street, and so we call it Swift Street. And that's in a new development. So sometimes we get a chance to do a big infill project or a greenfill project and design whole new streets uh, in whole cloth um, from scratch. And it's, it's an exciting thing to do. You can incorporate everything you've learned uh, and try to get it right from the beginning. Most of the time, however, all of us involved in growth and change and design are dealing with places that are already partly built. That they are, we are reclaiming them or we're repurposing them, uh, including the suburban places that need retrofit. And so I think the best thing that we can give people uh, about street design is to teach them to look at the historic precedents. Because the examples of what to do that actually works, that withstands change uh, and endures, are all around us. Um, St. Charles is, a, is an exciting one because you know the streetcar didn't stop running there. We still have the streetcar in St. Charles Avenue. Uh, and there's something about being in that part of New Orleans where if you're waiting for the streetcar, you can wait in great dignity because what they call the neutral ground, the rest of the country calls a median, the neutral ground of, is not just a place for the tracks to run or an interruption in the, uh, the lanes that go in opposite directions. It's actually a continuous linear park, right? And when you wait for the streetcar, you wait in great dignity, you know, next to the proud houses that face it with their front porches, under the great canopy of oaks, uh, and in this very refreshing and positive green space. Now, there's traffic swirling all around you when you're doing it. One of the things that's interesting about St. Charles are these little ruts. Do you see them? The little uh, worn out places? Anybody? Obviously, the train isn't doing that. Any idea? It's the runners. It's the joggers. You're absolutely right. Because that streetcar doesn't move so terribly fast, and it's not always there, it's moving back and forth, the people who use their built environment, their outdoor space in the heart of the city as their gym, take over that space between the tracks uh, when the streetcar is a block or two away, and they use it as a running path. And that is a, that is a great way of thinking about everything we build uh, in street design, because it has more than one purpose, including some that weren't programmed for it. There weren't all that many joggers uh, in New Orleans when St. Charles was built. The lessons that we get from the street designs we studied are pretty basic line things up to the simple alignment of the front porches on this, uh, this street in the historic district of New Point. Um, New Point Road is interesting. You know, when they built it, they decided to keep the curb to curb dimensions a little narrower than the standard in that part of South Carolina. They made the surface of the road itself just a little rougher, a little more aggregate uh, than the typical. And so you feel that in your, in your steering wheel as you drive along it. No big gutter. And of course, the dimensions are all tight, like the uh, houses that are within what Vince Graham, the developer, calls conversational distance of the sidewalk. This is uh, called the historic district of New Point because it's the first phase that they built. But this is actually a new street. This is only about 20 years old. Two years after they finished it, they were moving on to the next block. And this began to be known as the historic district. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason it's called that is because it has the characteristics that people knew from old Beaufort uh, or old Port Royal uh, in their nearby towns. The tree canopy is part of it. So there are, I'm going to pause on this one for just a second and talk to you about some of the themes 
that come up again and again over in the book. One is this idea of wholeness, that it's a whole ensemble, private and public, that every development, I should pause and repeat that for emphasis, every development is a public-private partnership, even if all the local government is doing is maintaining the road over time. And of course, most of the time, they're doing far more than that. The private development that faces it and shapes that street space and the public effort to either build or build and maintain um, that uh, street space is all one thing and it's all one design problem. So you can't actually just say, we're not worried about the land development regulation yet or the setback yet or um, what have you or what the architecture might be someday. We're just doing the street right now. Can't do that. Actually, it has to go together as one idea. The, the second thought um, that comes up again and again in the book is um, about our misplaced emphasis on speed, or that is, misplaced emphasis on high speed. Um, every traffic engineer will sit down at the beginning of a street design problem and establish something called the design speed. This isn't the posted speed, but rather the speed that they're intending to get to happen. The target speed is that speed they hope 85% of the people will maintain or go slower than in that space. When the design speed is high, guess what happens? All the dimensions have to be big. You know how that is. The interstate highway lanes are wider because if you make one little tick or tock of your steering wheel, you're going to move, you're going to swerve, you're going to be way out of the way because you're moving at tremendous velocity. You need a wider lane. The nearest tree has to be farther back, right? The nearest slope has to be cut more shallow. And the nearest building has to be farther back. The clear sight distance at the corner has to be wider. Everything pushes apart when the design speed is too high. Design speed is high, you're not going to want to do things like have on street parking or welcome a cyclist there um, or spend much time alongside that street as a pedestrian. Now, selecting a good de low, slow design speed is harder than it sounds because it's a little counterintuitive. Traffic is congested and we're about to rebuild our town. What should we do? The <coughs> instinctive human response is to say, let's relieve the congestion because we all want to flow. Flow just sounds good. Let's flow. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem with that is that as you speed up the design and speed up the flow, you probably won't get that many more cars through a lane of traffic in an hour. <coughs> There's an engineering reason for that. Um, but on the other hand, you will push away all of those other things. Those happy pedestrians, gone. Those happy cyclists, gone. The ones, the hardy cyclists that are willing to share the road because every lane is a bike lane uh, with the vehicles, even they are scared off. Uh, the buildings that would have been close, the storefronts that would have opened to that street, they're pushed back, they turn their back on it. Maybe they put the garage that side because the space is negative. Now, the engineering reason that getting more cars through is you can Google this. It's called the speed flow capacity diagram. Remember that. Turns out that the most efficient speed at which to operate a lane of traffic and get the most cars through a lane of traffic in an hour is somewhere just north of 25 miles an hour. And after that, it's diminishing returns. You don't get more cars through. You get fewer cars through that or past that same point in space per hour as you speed it up. So there's not much point in doing it. But if you drop the speed, you can welcome back the cyclists to share the road. You drop the speed, you can bring back the pedestrians next to the place. So the pace of things is really an important factor in design. Third, uh, keep it simple, stupid. Everybody knows the KISS rule, right? I can't tell you how many times as we went in search of great examples of streets that had been retrofitted, what we found is that retrofit to their designers meant adding a lot of stuff. And I'll show you some pictures of that. But the best retrofits we found were actually reducing the amount of signs and stripes and special features and keeping it pretty simple. Like Robert Stern's first rule of design, line things up. Now, the last two were unexpected in a conversation about street design because they sound arty and cultural. And I'm doing the arty cultural argument here because well, the book is about the art of street design, not the engineering or science of it. There are a couple of things. Lining, lining up street trees, lining up lampposts so that there's a kind of coherence to the space, or at least placing those elements in the space in a deliberate, designed way is part of the composition. 
he almost never used the word composed to describe things like a street design or establishing the height regulations for buildings. Arlington may be one of the exceptions because of your long <coughs> discussion about the, uh, the tent pole uh, of Roslyn, for example, about how th that's actually composing your skyline. Most s local governments are afraid to use a word that sounds so subjective to describe the business of deciding what's permitted and what's not. And then there are things like how you align the street. Do you align it so that you create what the urbanists call a terminated vista? That is the, the special building or special feature or view at the end of a long axis? Or a deflected <coughs> vista? Um, a picturesque design or a formal one? And then this idea of streets, especially as corridors, it's often as if the departments of transportation want to take one standard cross section and then extrude that along the entirety of a street corridor, consistent from one end to the other for miles and miles. It actually has been done to great effect in, say, the Parisian boulevards. But that's the rare exception. Most of the time, we need to compose a street corridor as a series of discrete segments laid end to end that are like special experiences, one after the other. And every segment doesn't have to be like every other segment. So those are composition issues. And I guess you've probably begun to figure out what this last one is about. We're demanding species. If we don't find something positive about a place, uh, if, we, if it doesn't spark our sense of wonder, we probably won't come back there and spend money there. Or we probably won't come back there to roost and raise our young there. Uh, so you have to inspire people, not just move them. Um, so we started looking in the book at these various issues. You know, the, the vista, the terminated vista. This is Turrell Street, which all the poets write about in Oxford. And it's one significant compositional decision. The lean-in tree here that leaning in from the garden and shapes everything about your experience up and down that two block long street in Oxford. That's the composition decision that makes its unique sense of place. Some say that's the second most important tree in England. Now, when I talk about design, I don't want you to get the impression that we're just talking about design as if it's the only factor that matters. Because lots of other factors matter too. Location still matters a lot. Mixed use matters a lot. Okay? And I don't want you to think that we're only talking about formal designs. Like the very impressive one uh, in the Parisian Boulevards, this is the Avenue Foch, which was designed really to, s to send a message to visitors about the impressive, rational workings of the nation state. That's kind of the way it was set up, designed to give you that message. Wait, what's this? We're not just moving from A to B, but we're communicating a message as well, right? Some of the places we admire can do that and turn out to be very sustainable and worth reinvesting in, and some do not. So it turns out that street design has a kind of veto power over this recyclability, endurance, and environmental performance. If you can't get the street design right, then it's a, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that everybody will drive all of the time. Um, th I love this example from Dumfries. It's the high street in Dumfries because <coughs> it's the opposite of the avenue floor. The compositional decision here is that everything is <coughs> not formal. Everything here is actually just a little bit off and a little bit quirky and a little bit strange. Every space is uh, diffuse in terms of def its definition for who does what where. The space itself is a s one of those segmental experiences that's different along its length from one edge to another. Uh, it's both picturesque and formal. There's that terminated vista. So we started looking at these streets not as two-dimensional things you could draw in a plan view or in a cross section, but as three dimensional things, uh, and discover some wonderful stuff. The most important one is we want people to live more healthy lives. <coughs> you have to make it nice to be outside. Um, <coughs> in Amsterdam, they say, ding, ding, you're dead. Have you heard that before? <laughs> if you hear ding, ding, it means that one of these people that's terrassing through Amsterdam on their bikes is ringing their bell and telling you, I'm right behind you, I'm about to run over you, or you're about to hit, see a tram. It's a little disconcerting for Americans at first to be in old Amsterdam where there are almost no traffic signals and almost no stop signs. 
In fact, almost no markings of any kind in the old part of town. And almost all uh, actors in the space are moving in all directions at all times. They basically, those bikes go through the intersections when they feel it's safe to do so in their own judgment. And after a couple of days in Amsterdam, you start feeling comfortable. You realize, for example, that this is all, this whole drama of the bikes going back and forth and the trams and the people walking across the intersections is all happening at such a slow pace and with such light vehicle or vehicle uh, occupant combinations that if a collision were to occur, it would be minor. And, the, and uh, it's pretty amazing to watch. And we need to do this because we want healthier people who are fighting off the epidemics of obesity and heart disease and hypertension. Um, but we also need to fight off uh, epidemics of mental illness and, uh, and isolation. And so those front porches and conversation distance of sidewalks, that's not extra stuff. That's added on at the end as a little luxury benefit. It's actually how you combat the problems of modern life. Uh, those, uh, those young people who were raised on Seinfeld and Friends that I was talking about before are actually pretty picky about this. You must have seen the recent uh, uh, op-ed piece written as a letter, uh, Dear Mom and Dad, Boomers, we're not going to buy your house. Very interesting. <laughs> um, there's this whole generation of people who are saying we want something different, including a city where we can live, even if we have that ugly a sweater. <laughs> and to live, the, to live the life they want to live, they have to have one of these places that satisfies more than one way of moving around. Uh, this is uh, not on the tourist par uh, part of uh, a Parisian experience. This is the everyday Parisian life experience on the Boulevard Rochechouart. And it's very interesting for me to see the number of things that are simultaneously using this space. It's a space where people sell things in storefronts, where people live on that address, where people have their workspaces on that address. They park there, they unload trucks there, they move buses there, they move bikes there, they move pedestrians there, they move subway riders there underneath. They have public events there. Um, the whole life of the city unfolds in a very small amount of space. It's an incredibly efficient and beautiful um, kind, of, um, kind of space. It, it wasn't like they had to actually build something gigantic to get all modes and all users satisfied, the so-called goal of the complete streets movement. Now, we have a very good thing going on in our country that goes by that bumper sticker. Complete streets, and I'm for it. We praise the, the, the leaders of the complete streets movement in the book and say, yes, way to go, excellent, great start. But we do make a call and we challenge a little bit for the next generation of complete streets project to be what we would call completer streets. Our argument, for example, is it's not just enough to restripe and remark the road and announce now this space is for cyclists and pedestrians too, uh, not just not just vehicles, not just uh, cars. It's not enough to do that because if that's all you do, you're probably not going to end up in a, with a space that where people really want to be in any great numbers. And this is in Long Beach, which is kind of one of the California utopian destination cities for. Um, complete streets advocates and, and uh, cycling lovers. And it has this kind of condition. This is, a, this is by the way, straight out of the National Association of Tr City Transportation Officials manual on uh, the ur urban bikeway guide. It says, uh, when the bike lane on this one-way street approaches the intersection and we have to make room for that left turn pocket that here at rush hour nobody was actually using, that's important. We have to swerve the bike lane out into the middle of traffic and cross it with the left turning vehicles and bring them to the corner, get everybody lined back up and then have them readjust again on the other end of the, it's crazy. And so in the name of complete streets, we've been building things that actually look, even just isolated in a slide, slightly dangerous and don't make you feel great about being a pedestrian in that space. Now up till now, a lot of the complete streets projects uh, for, with all the best of intentions have been about adding a riot of, um, of markings. Here's one of the more orderly ones. Um, you know, red lanes for bikes, uh, for buses, green lanes for bikes, diagonal stripes for buffers between parking spaces, highway size, uh, thermoplastic markings, ugly white plastic sticks. This is 
do spend a little space in the book attacking the ugly white plastic sticks. <laughs> With reflectors on them and rubber bases, um, the piano key markings, um, this is state of the art, uh, First Avenue in New York. When all of that language of the highway, even the interstate highway, brought into the city, more paint, more stripes, more colors, more bold, more signage, more reflectors, um, in an effort to get people started on the idea of sharing the space with more users. I, it's to be applauded. Jeanette Senate Khan, the uh, outgoing transportation commissioner in New York City, is one of our heroines. And she's revolutionized that city with this approach, uh, most of it done inexpensively and with paint, uh, at least in the demonstration projects. But we look at this and we say, is it beautiful yet? Did it actually hit that memorable, wonderful, great place to be test yet? A completer street <coughs> would do that. So our test is, if it's not beautiful, it's not a complete street. Um, in fact, the ugly white and ugly yellow plastic sticks thing <laughs> is just amazing. It's a nationwide uh, blooming all over our street spaces, all over the place. Now, when you're done adding that much paint and stripe what you've done is reinforce psychologically that this is auto space. All of those signals, unlike the skinny streets you saw in Amsterdam, are sending a message, this is auto space, watch out and be afraid. Um, there was a competition held in New York recently for the so-called design of the perfect 21st century street. Um, and so here, uh, one of the architects has kind of appropriated that language uh, and mixed it up with the the uh, pavers and banners and <coughs> benches and bollards and uh, what have you of the 1970s streetscape projects and design what they, th what they call the 21st century street. Here notice the left turn swerve all at a very gentle and broad angle so you can do it in your car at high speed without any friction or impedance. Uh, and we challenge this and say, wait, the 21st century street ought to be better than that. Um, so we did realize that we needed a richer menu of streets. We needed to be able to go back to streets that had been built poorly and lead people through transformations of them. And we needed skinny streets, not just wide ones. We need wide ones that are great, and medium-sized ones that are great, and super skinny ones that are great. This <laughs> one's in Melbourne, Look at her. Yeah. safe in the street in Melbourne. And Melbourne has some of the widest, grandest multi-way boulevards, just a block from here. So it's about having a bigger menu than just the, the sort of dumbed down, this is a collector, this is an arterial, this is a local street. Um, now, I talked about what this means for health or for environment. It's worth spending just a second to talk about what it means for your bottom line and your money. Um, our colleague Joe Minicosi and others have been going around showing charts like this one. I know many of you have seen these before. But comparing um, two kinds of development in terms of their property taxes per acre. You know, very often when a new development in the strip suburban uh, or big box mode is proposed, it's, the argument is made that, well, it's going to be great for tax base, we're going to create some jobs, and we're going to bring cash registers. Remember, the local government's number one thing they can do uh, to uh, promote their own value and economy and change their own revenue stream is decide how to regulate the development in that place. That's the thing they do. How much of this? How much can you do with this acre or that acre? That's what the local governments do. And then what they get back as a result of those decisions is either higher or lower depending on it. Now, if you just got this a uh, hundred times, the property taxes per acre for that simple little uh, downtown mixed use building, than the one thirty-four acre project out in the burbs. So Joe went out and found fifteen different cities. Uh, from the upper Midwest and uh, the Mountain West to Florida and everywhere in between, and he did that same analysis. And here's the typical mall or strip. Um, here's Main Street at a couple of stories, and here's uh, the six-story scale. And you can kind of see the difference in the performance. Well, that money is the money that local governments use to make things go. So if you want to have a great Parks and Rec Department, or have great public transportation, or have great schools, and all of those things, 
uh, have great police protection and great fire protection and what have you, that money has to flow. <coughs> the money that makes things go. Uh, and whether that money is small or large will depend on how you regulate the use of the land. Well, you can't get the positive high value return unless you have great streets for those kind of buildings <coughs> to rest next to. Um, now, that's not to suggest that only big projects are important. I love Schumacher's old book that has kind of come back to us. And when we were researching the book, I found this storefront in Barcelona, which kind of exemplifies the idea that small business actually thrives on the real streets, not on the, uh, the collector arterials. This, this, you're looking at the entire business. This is all the square footage. This is his entire storefront. There's no question at all what he sells because the guy's a brilliant visual merchandiser, as the retail people call him. He's got loyal customers. This one's canine. <laughs> Try doing that on the eight-lane arterial. Now, as we photograph things, I pointed out Nantucket, we found that again and again we were coming up with great examples in places that were very expensive because of that scarcity issue. So we went out of our way in the book uh, to find places which had um, moderate income families and modest and denser development on, that still came back with the same great streets. And so we include a number of those uh, in the book as well, the disclaimer made. I'm going to finish by showing you five simple things that we always look for. It's easy. It's a good test that you can have in the back of your mind when you're looking at the latest street design. Uh, the reason for putting this in the book is subversive. It's so that the mayor or the uh, county board chair or the chief urban designer or the planning director um, or the redevelopment director or the citizen activist can go into a meeting and open up this big fat book with 500 pictures in it and say, they have this, why can't we have this? And that's exactly why we did it. First characteristic is that these great streets always have a shape. I talked about it before as a public room and how the private buildings form the walls and the sidewalks and pavements and so on form the floor. That is a fundamental idea. If you can't control uh, where the buildings are positioned on their lots. This is a rather stark example from uh, Galena, Illinois. Routinely voted as one of the top five main streets in the country, by the way. Um, then you can't get a great street space. So that shape is really important. This is a diagram made by the famous Justin Falango <laughs> a couple of years ago um, to illustrate this idea of height to width proportion. When you see new urbanists going around like this, They're not like filmmakers framing up the next shot or a University of Miami fans saying, it's all about the youth. They're looking at the height to width proportions, the buildings on the side of the trees that form the sides of that spatial room versus the width. When the width is really wide, the sense of spatial enclosure goes down, the sense of place goes down, property value also goes down. Okay? So that little tiny decision about what you do on one lot with one building to street relationship, like this one in Great Barrington, actually has regional implications because you're either going to end up with a street where people like to walk in that town and do make one less trip or they park their car and park once and do several things or you're going to get the kind of town where people drive for everything all the time. So you get regional implications out of small scale decisions. One of them is shape. <laughs> Shapedness occurs at the big st on the big streets like the big grand multi-way boulevards and on the little streets like uh, the small farm village. I, it's worth pausing here since I'm in a town full of architecture schools to say this is not about style, just so you know. Uh, the, the urbanism ideas of a building placement and shaping public space are independent of uh, architectural style. It can be done with modern buildings and it can be done with historicist buildings and it can be done with genuinely traditional buildings, and it can be done with half-heartedly traditional buildings. And, and it is all the time. So I just want to make the point that it isn't really about style, nor is it about price point, necessarily. Uh, this is in the south side in Chattanooga. It's a new street, 17th Street, uh, that they built to try and bring back that part of town uh, from the dead, and they did. But they did it at a relatively modest price. It's a simple street that they built, and the the houses that are, that are all along it are sold for relatively modest amounts, uh, and yet they're beautiful. These are straight out of plan books. They're the equivalent of Sears and Roebuck houses 
about 100 years ago. Some of them are uh, traditional, like the ones you saw. Some of them are resolutely modern. Uh, so again, it's not about style. In fact, some of them are so are modern, they almost seem to be built so as to get a disclaimer out there on the street saying, we're not doing style, so don't pick on us about that. Okay. Um, and that's in Chattanooga at a modest price. Now that said, we do spend some time talking about the difference in the building to street relationships that we seem to get pretty consistently from traditional buildings and we don't seem to get consistently from modern ones, uh, even high design ones. This, this is on East 70th Street uh, between Park and Lexington uh, on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. And the, uh, you're looking at two different parts of the street. Um, this is the street that Woody Allen called the most beautiful block in New York. That's the film here. And this was built in the 1930s by uh, William Lascaz, or Lascazi, a uh, brilliant industrial designer and set designer and architect at the time. Uh, so it wasn't like they went, you know, it went modern because they were uh, doing low price or looking for cheap consultants who wouldn't take the time to design that cornice or what have you. No, and it's deliberately done as a kind of test case about whether you could do modern buildings in and among traditional ones and done to great effect. And I ask you, if you had a whole street of the building on the right, one after another after another, would it give you the same feeling you get when you have a whole street of the type on the left? So there is something about the traditional buildings, their ability to uh, stand as if they are obeying the laws of gravity, their ability to take wetness, the moisture that falls on us, and move it away from the building and let the building get stained in a way that makes it better and better over time rather than looking dirty over time. Uh, that is pretty important. So more about that, and if you want to get into that debate more deeply, um, read the book. <laughs> now I'll go faster on the, those, the hardest one, is the shape and this question about image and style. Uh, from here, we go to what have you done to adapt to the climate? Streets where we like to be are almost always the ones that are fine-tuned for making you comfortable when you're there, even if there's a sudden storm or there's a lot of glare. So you walk down the Rambla in Barcelona and uh, the canopy extends out over the sidewalk. So your the storefront has got a little bit of a, a protection from the sudden glare. You've got a place to wait for a transit or your taxi in dignity um, and so on. The trees are a big part of climate adaptation. Uh, so it isn't just about doing things like an awning to shield the storefront from glare. It's also about doing things like, uh, especially in the temperate zones, uh, putting in the street tree canopy that will allow for more sunlight to get into your buildings in the winter and, and warm your streets and allow a more dappled, uh, diffuse sunlight to hit you when you walk down that sidewalk in the summer. Um, street trees. There are at least seven roles for the urban street tree. I'm not going to describe what they all are. Uh, but it couldn't be more important. And when people ask me, what's the most important thing we can do, the cheapest, the fastest now, I always say, plant more trees. And I come to Arlington, and I see a street where three trees were recently removed, either lost to storm damage or to blight, or to road widening. And I see one skinny little street tree that was placed in its place. I think, wait, that's not the trend. You need to be putting back more than you remove. Um, and Street trees are tricky because obviously it takes a long time for them to grow to their full majestic height and produce a ceiling for the public room. Of course, that's why you should start. That's not why you should wait. That's why you should do it now. Even if you just plant a few this month or this year, or you put a few in the budget year next year and a few more the year after, at least you are moving forward on it uh, as opposed to waiting to ever start. Connectedness. The streets we like are always the streets that are connected to the larger fabric of the city. Um, that means the street plan of the town itself is less like a tree and more like a web. Um, and so we, these days we do a lot of analysis. If you follow uh, Green Building, you know about LEED, um, the Green Building Rating Standard uh, System. LEED for Neighborhood Design asks you, how many intersections do you have for a square mile? And we devise a fairly complicated formula for how you should count this up. Um, you, for example, don't count the cul-de-sacs intersection if you have to come back the way you went to get out. Um, but you can count the alleys and things like that. And once you go through that formula and you add it up, some places have a really low number, like this piece of Texas, 
Some places have a little more. Here's a 1960s design uh, from Miami Lakes, Newtown. Here's a little more, the, the new urbanist Newtown of Celebration, designed by Robert Stern and Jack Robertson. Um, uh, in Central Florida, gets up to 377 intersections per square mile. Just for contrast, Rome, uh, 1,000 plus intersections per square mile. Well, when you have a lot of links and nodes, as they call it, you can have a lot of skinny streets because you spread the traffic like capillaries through a tremendous number of alternative routes. Believe me, just do the math. A two by two grid will give you six ways to go from A to B to get from one corner to the other. And, but an eight by eight great grid will give you 12,870 ways to go from A to B. So that's connected. Now there's some big benefits with connectedness. I'll just show you one, which is that your carbon footprint drops. It falls off like that as a result of connectivity because your trips can be shorter. Pretty important. Safe has a couple of dimensions. Um, the most obvious one is that you don't want to get run over, right? If you're out there as a pedestrian in particular, uh, and there's a reason for this. You've probably seen this, this diagram. It compares just a small uptick in speed from 20 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour, and then what percentage of the accidents where cars crash with pedestrians turns out to be fatal jumps from 5% to over 50%. And then at 40 miles per hour, over 80% fatal. So speed kills. I told you before, you're not getting a lot more cars through a lane of traffic when you speed them up. So don't think you're getting that benefit. So if that's the case, and you're just upping the mayhem, why are you doing it? Just think about that a little bit. So safe is partly about that fear of not getting run over. And places are getting pretty creative. Uh, in Fort Royal, South Carolina, the signs say 21 and a half miles per hour. Uh, one of our projects, the signs say 17 and a half miles per hour. Yes, that does not match the manual of uniform traffic control devices instructions about that sort of thing. Uh, but they are trying to get the message out that slow is better than fast. The next part of safe is sharing the space. And here we have a mammal. You know the acronym? Middle-aged man in Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> sharing the space with uh, someone uh, riding who's dressed far differently, sharing the space with cyclists, motorcyclists, pedestrians, uh, and uh, motorists. And so our peer countries that are making competitive cities and are recycling their land are getting really good at this. And they tend to add uh, the complete streets aspect to what they build in a way that builds on the beauty that's inherent in the original designs. Um, just a, a thought for you to consider there. Um, that's quite different from the First Avenue riot of color and stripe and thermoplastic that I showed you before. Um, line things up. And so what we're seeing is that in, the, in some of the mature cities, the cycling infrastructure doesn't look like um, something that has been foreign, that has been inserted into the space. It actually looks like something that's inherent in the design of the place. In fact, what a beautiful experience you can have as a cyclist riding through an alley of aligned trees, like uh, London plane trees there. So you up the experience. You've probably seen these before. They, uh, they contrast the amount of space it takes for the same number of people in their individual cars or uh, in transit vehicles. So sharing the space, well, if we make more of the trips through some means other than a single occupant car trip, we'll have plenty of room in these roads for all the users that want to be there including the ones who don't want to be there in a car. Now, the second part of state safe that goes beyond, um, or the third part, rather, that goes beyond the users and beyond the speed is natural surveillance, or what Jane Jacobs called eyes on the street. And this has to do with the idea that if you're in the street space, you don't have to fear getting mugged there because you know that that space is being watched. Uh, and you can tell because it has doors and windows and storefronts and balconies and porches and things like that on the fronts of the buildings, the kind of the, the uh, signals of occupants in the buildings on its side. And you know that in that space, if somebody came along to do some devilment, someone else might see them. And that discourages the criminal activity. It's a long history in what's called uh, crime prevention through environmental design that builds on that idea. There's another part to it, too. If you're not the criminal, but you're just somebody else, and you're wondering, what would happen to me? Say I'm a senior citizen. And I'm walking along, what would happen to me if I 
took ill here, and I needed help, or I called for help. Would someone know I'm there? Well, not on that garage door street of the snout houses, and not on the street with the blank walls, but yes, on a street like this one. So safe includes that aspect. And so those porches and conversational distance to the sidewalk, which just looked like things you add on to make it sell well in a rendering or in a real estate ad, no, no. They're actually essential equipment to making the pedestrians happy in that space. And there are other things we get from that, like elevated finished floors um, for a ground floor residential. So that's not slab on grade every time. Uh, I know there's a big subject here about accessibility, and I'm not going to cover the whole thing, but suffice to say, you want pedestrians to be happy in a space? You can't put all of the adjacent ground floor residential space at grade, matching it precisely the same, or they will feel uncomfortable there. The last one is about that demanding species, the people who need the wonder, and that's it has to be interesting right, uh, in order to go back. Uh, that doesn't have to be special necessarily, although many great streets are. You just have to have a good experience there. So you, when you want to meet your friend for lunch, you go to that street to do it. Um, memorability partly comes from composition. Here's the deflected vista that I talked about before. That's the high street in Oxford, and that's the most important tree in England. Or remember Galena, Illinois, the street that had the great shape in the public room? Well, their compositional decision has to do with that curve, which means that the vista is terminated as you move along it, and you don't see straight down the whole <coughs> way. Um, and that's what makes part of it wonderful. So in the book, we actually look at historic streets, and all sorts of discoveries were made there. This, for example, uh, some of you might recognize as the Avenue Diana. I call it the most beautiful parking lot in the world. And yes, it has the Arc de Triomphe at one end. But if you take a hard look at that street, what you discover is that um, along with the, the through-going lanes in the center, which are quite generous in their size, there's parking on both sides of the medians on both sides and on the side access lanes. And so there are more than 300 on-street parking spaces per block on that linear parking lot, otherwise known as the grand and beautiful linear park that is the Avenue Deanna. So why do we build those ugly parking lots again? Um, my favorite retrofit project is just outside our office, outside the Metro Rail Station in South Miami, Florida, uh, where we, a few years ago, we took an alley and uh, changed it into the social center of the community. It was not that difficult. It just gave some space back to pedestrians. My second favorite retrofits are, of course, the ones on, on Columbia Pike, which are, I'm glad to say, uh, detailed in an extensive case study and richly illustrated in street design. Uh, some of them are really surprising. This looks like a great main street to be on, and you can imagine walking from one end of it to the other and getting um, from one part of the city to the other. You couldn't do that when it was just an expressway. You were just here. And the building I showed you is the one that was in Columbus that was built over the highway. Uh, it's called the Cap at Union Station. And they actually used that little tiny thing, one block of Main Street buildings hovering over the expressway to tie back together two parts of their town that had been broken in half uh, by the highway. We have cities that are broken in half by arterials. You know, 90 plus percent of the people in Manhattan uh, don't use a car to get to, to, get to work. More than 80% don't even own a car. Uh, and yet roads like Second uh, are made crazy big and crazy fast for the benefit of commuters uh, from off the island. So. We've actually produced some speculative graphics, radical things, and deliberately trying to get people's attention here, uh, saying what would happen if we recaptured that space because the commuter from Long Island might think that that is just an arterial through Manhattan. But if you live on the Upper East Side, you think that's your local neighborhood street. So what if, before and after, which is the essence of retrofit. You can see exactly that kind of thing uh, in great detail in Kensington in London. Kensington High Street is, I think, the best retrofit yet executed. They, um, they took away the guardrails that used to keep pedestrians from going near the cars. Um, they took out a lot of signs and, and, uh, and signals and other things. They put the bikes in the center of the street. They made a really simple gray-on-gray -gray palette uh, for the streetscape improvements. They kept all the dimensions small and all the details simple, and it works great. 
uh, the most challenging part of the book to write was that about new streets, uh, which sometimes get built skinny, which is great to see, um, and sometimes get planned for mixed use. Um, we, as we go through this, we try to illustrate the menu of types that I described, 11 essential street types, and then we give dimensions. It's you know, cross sections and things like that. Again, the subversive purpose here is to say, once we were good at this, can't we be this again? Um, we look at main streets. We look at mid-block passages. Uh, we look at leafy residential streets, and skinny streets like this one uh, in Center City, Philadelphia. We even look at the skinniest streets in Charleston or the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, Trevor, this one's for you. Um, the uh, 99 Steps, one of the best streets in Charlotte Amalie on St. Thomas, uh, is a step street. It's just too steep to run the road up that, up that incline, so the street stops and the steps begin, and the pedestrian continuity is achieved. Phenomenal thing. St. Thomas has a collection of more than 45 of these. Um, and Trevor tells me he's going to design the Step Street 10K soon so we can get out there and burn some calories. <laughs> One little disclaimer, the 99 Steps has 103 steps. <laughs> I've counted them. Arcaded streets and side streets. Suburban places and what we ought to do with them as the malls gray out and new things need to replace them. All that goes in there. And we spend a little bit of time uh, sort of doing an autopsy on the streets that uh, seem to accomplish none of what I've been describing tonight. We put some of the blame on the standards. Uh, we challenge the old uh, overly simplistic small menu of arterial collector and local of rural, which means suburban, and urbanized, which means suburban, in the, in the engineer's manuals, and, if, um, and what that leads to this uh, so-called conflict between mobility and access that is the basis for this decision to classify roads into different functions um, is where a lot of this comes from. So uh, recently, Rick Hall, traffic engineer, uh, my co-author John Massingale and I have been pushing uh, for our colleagues at the USDOT to take the lead on improving that crude system. Uh, you can go to change.org and you look this up and you can sign a petition, uh, last count, something like 1,500 people have already done that, uh, saying we need a better system. So we don't have to ask for special exceptions uh, or de so-called design exceptions and do 30 pages of paperwork every time we'd like to make a great street instead of a stupid one. Thank you very much. Am I in trouble? No, you're fine. I was trying. Victor, thank you very much.